So we've now seen how we can use the principles of biophysical ecology to calculate body temperatures of organisms and know that you can also use the same, uh, same kinds of equations to work out the water loss of an organism as well um, as a function of microclimate and how we can get at the microclimate. So that will give us a snapshot perspective on the consequences of a given environment for an organism in terms of heat and water. And this can be really important in limiting distributions, really important dimensions to the niche. But now what we're going to look at is the energy budget. This is going to give us access to that, the ontogeny of the organism, how it um, goes through its life cycle, uh, how it grows, develops and reproduces as constrained by the environmental conditions. And this will give us an important temporal dimension to the niche from a mechanistic point of view and opens up um, the issue of phenology, which um, I think is one of the most important things in, in relation to whether a species can survive or not, whether the organism's life cycle is timed appropriately in terms of stressful events uh, and in terms of resource availability. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned in the first part of this series on mechanistic niche modeling, the theory that um, I'm using to do the energy budget is dynamic energy budget theory. And it's a metabolic theory that is getting access to, or giving us access to <clears throat> these equations, these parts of our thermodynamic niche set of equations relating to the mass exchange and energy exchange. Um, so the process of um, taking up food from the environment and using that to build the body, um, develop, grow, reproduce and so on, and also these fluxes of, um, of matter, oxygen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogenous waste and water. And by giving us access to all of this, we can combine it with the heat budget um, and the water budget that we can get from biophysical ecology. And these things go hand in glove and give each other what they need. Um, you know, the, the biophysical models for heat exchange need size um, and the the energy budget model is giving us the size as the organism goes through its ontogeny. But this um, model of the animal's energetics needs the temperature so that it knows the rate at which things are going. So the biophysical model feeds back to that. And what I'll do at the end of this, this part of the, of the mechanistic niche modeling section um, is to show how these integrate and allow us to um, calculate using all of these things together, the time course of the organism's ontogeny and what that means for the organism's ability to survive um, for its fitness, for its ability to persist at a location. Now the dynamic energy budget theory, it's a metabolic theory. Um, there's a lot of excitement about metabolic th theory lately since about uh, 2000, especially with a focus on some work by um, Jim Brown and his colleagues. Uh, this theory, the dynamic energy budget theory, came from a Dutch scientist, Bas Koeman, uh, and it's actually less well known, but actually is doing um, what the metabolic theory aims to do, um, but without some of the inconsistencies and issues that have been discovered with some of the theoretical aspects of the metabolic theory of ecology. Um, so I think it's really worth uh, paying attention to this particular theory and uh, if, you, if you're at all interested in metabolic theory, this, this I think is a, is a very, very powerful way of approaching the same goals that are proposed within that broad umbrella of the metabolic theory of ecology. But let me just give you a bit of background on, on where it came from. So that the whole theory um, came about when Bas Koeman was working as a consultant and was asked um, to, to, was given the problem of working out how reproduction in Daphnia is affected by Toxin. So it was an ecotox question, and that led him to start to put together um, a full energy budget of Daphnia, which then led him to develop a rather broad theory that applies to any kind of organism. So <clears throat> the whole thing started in terms of publications with this publication from 1984, which is in a which is about population dynamics. So so the whole idea was to to develop a way of making a population dynamics model on the basis of individual energetics. And that led to the first theoretical paper describing, or papers describing describing the model. Uh, energy budgets can explain body size relations in 1986 and also in the journal, that's in the Journal of Mathematical Biology and the Journal of Theoretical Biology, uh, a paper about egg development and how that relates to this theory. Not the most high profile publications, but um, way back then this theory was 
was you know to a large extent finalized um, and then a book was produced in 1993 about the about the ideas about the concepts and there's been uh, a couple more editions with a few new ideas added in and um, the final the final uh, the latest book is, is 2010 edition I think this will probably be the, be the last um, the book uh, in the Deb theory series which describes the full theory uh, so what is the point of Deb theory the idea is to try and capture all the metabolic processes in a network across the whole life cycle of the organism. So it's not just looking at one aspect of metabolism like growth, it's looking at the whole, the whole network of things that are going on and how they change dynamically through the life cycle. So <clears throat> the processes <clears throat> are these things that you can see in the screen here, the process of feeding, defecation, assimilation, maintenance, growth, maturation and reproduction. Okay, so how does it work? Okay, so how does it work? Here is my attempt at trying to explain Deb theory in about 10 minutes. Um, we'll see how we go. So in setting up any thermodynamic system, the most important thing is working out what the state variables are. And in Deb theory, the state variables that have been chosen are called the reserve, the structure and the level of maturity. So the reserve and structure um, can be thought of in terms of the dimensions of energy or mass. It's really a theory about mass. It probably should be called dynamic mass budgets uh, rather than dynamic energy budget theory. But you can um, change from a frame of reference of energy or mass if you know how much energy there is per mass. So, so there's the reserve, the structure, um, both in terms of energy or mass and then maturation or maturity, which is in the dimension of information. And perhaps the most important and clever uh, thing that is in Deb theory that allows it to work is the assumption that the reserve and the structure have a constant chemical composition. So you don't, you work with pools of biomass in the organism that you can treat as if it were of constant chemical composition. And by doing that, you're effectively treating these, these two things, reserve and structure, as macromolecules, and you can work out the chemical reactions um, to make that reserve molecule and to make that structure molecule. So that's the, the clever trick, if you like, one of the clever tricks in Deb theory. The other is to actually make the distinction between reserve and structure, and I'll explain that distinction a little bit further. Um, and, and note that I'm telling you about the simplest kind of dynamic energy budget theory or DEB model, where you have one reserve and one structure, but it is possible to have more um, reserve, multivariate DEB models with more than one reserve or more than one structure. But this simple model that I'm telling you about works for many, many different kinds of organisms. I say, so what is um, reserve? It's, it's not what you think it, probably think it is. It certainly wasn't what I thought it was. Um, I was thinking of reserve initially as, as fat, storage something for later and um and and something that might be made of fat but the best way to think of reserve is that it is what an egg's made of a freshly laid egg so in an egg there's everything that's needed to make a chicken or a lizard or whatever is going to hatch out of it so it's not just fats it's it's fats it's proteins uh, and it's carbohydrates and then the structure is what is what is being built from the reserve. So the structure um, actually is, is, because it's being built and it's a, a sort of a complex object that's being built, it actually um, requires maintenance. So the way, the other way to think about reserve versus structure is that the reserve is, is this storage of, um, of things that don't require maintenance where, where, and that are turning over in the organism, whereas the structure is the more permanent thing that's being built and must be maintained. And you should really think of reserve and structure at the cellular level. So um, a given cell will have certain components that you think of in the theory as reserve and certain components that you think of as structure. So you can see in this um, little algae, you can see little blobs of lipids inside the, the alga. So that's giving you a sense of this notion of blobs of reserve in, 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 the, um, in the structure of the cell. And Really, uh, when all the reserve is is what all the food goes into, um, 
gets converted into before it gets mobilized and used by the organism. And you don't want to store the reserve, the reserve as monomers. You want to store it as polymers, as blobs. So there's this process of feeding um, where food is being converted into reserve and um, or taken up. That's the feeding part, but then assimilation when the food is being converted into reserve. So as I said, all the food gets converted first into the reserve pool and then goes out of there to fuel all the metabolic processes and provide the, the building blocks for, for growth. And so that mobilized reserve, there's a certain amount flowing out of that reserve. It's, it's a pool and you can imagine it's sort of distributed across all the different cells um, and it's flowing out. It's gone, it's gone into those cells as blobs and then it's being mobilized and it's being some of, some of that energy and mass that's coming out of the reserve is being used to grow the structure. So it's coming down this pathway to build structure. Um, and uh, that's a chemical transformation. So it's converting this molecule, macromolecule called reserve into a different macromolecule called structure, which costs energy and also requires building blocks. Down the other fork, so let's just say 80% of the um, energy and matter coming out of the reserve is going down this path, then the other fraction, 20%, is going to a different uh, destination, which is to increase the level of maturity of the organism. So this is formally making development um, part of the model. So development is not so much you know, building the organism, it's making it more complex. And the analogy is, um, I guess, learning a language. There's a lot of energy that goes into learning a language, um, but um, no energy is lost when you forget it. And so um, this process of maturation is really technically thought of as information, but you can quantify it in terms of the energy that's been invested to get to, um, to, get to a certain level of maturity. So in fact, maturation is cumulative energy invested in maturation. Um, that's, that's how it's treated as a state variable. Um, and then a sort of technical point, which um, I'll just mention is, but it's critical to the theory, is that the density of the reserve, so the amount of reserve per structure, so this is little blob, green is reserve, say, and yellow is structure, so the density of the reserve and structure stays constant if the food stays constant. If, you, if the animal is growing under constant food, it will have a constant reserve structure ratio. The reserve and structure can have different chemical compositions, um, but if the animal is growing in a constant food environment, then the ratio of two, those two are staying the same, and so the animal's composition is actually staying the same. And this is what really happens. Animals have a very constant chemical composition when growing under constant food. And so uh, as the animal grows, uh, you'll see this blob um, showing that, that assumption. When, when the animal grows, the, the, the ratio um, of reserve to structure is staying constant. So it looks a bit like looking down, a, magnifying, the, um, magnifying the image of the cell. And it's this interface between the reserve and structure, the surface area interface, um, where these blobs of reserve are being eaten way out and, and mobilized that drives the whole reserve dynamics. So if you've heard about the metabolic theory of ecology, that became famous because of the idea that it's the branching networks of the uh, circulatory system and other distribution systems that's driving the, um, the, the, the driving the dynamics of the, um, the metabolic rate. In dev theory, it's not branching networks that's controlling this, it's actually the reserve structure interface. So this is the theoretical part of the of the dynamic energy budget theory that explains all of the things that the metabolic theory of ecology is trying to explain in terms of the scaling of metabolic rate with size and that sort of thing. But not all organisms have branching networks to distribute things, whereas all organisms need to have this um, reserve notion. Um, so it's a more general notion. So that rate of mobilization depends on the, the surface area interface. And so an organism with a greater density of reserve blobs is going to mobilize things faster. So there's some technical things about the dynamics of the reserve. Okay, now there's the maintenance costs. Um, so that structure that's being built, it's a complex thing. And um, it is, you know, according to the second law of thermodynamics, everything should become more disordered. So energy has to be put in constantly into maintaining the structure that's being built. 
And you know, the biomass of the organism is both the reserve plus the structure, um, but the maintenance costs go up with just the structural part of the organism, directly with the structural part. So you double the structure, you double the maintenance costs. Um, the thing is that the feeding rate is assumed to go up proportional to the surface area of the structure. So the feeding rate is going up more slowly. The assimilation rate, therefore, is going up more slowly. And so the, the rate of flow of things into the reserve is going up more slowly than the maintenance costs are as the animal grows. And so there's priority to pay maintenance of anything that's coming down this branch. Um, first, you have to pay maintenance on what structure is, is there, and then any profits can go into further growth. But as the animal goes through its um, time course of development uh, and growth, the because of that surface area uh, increasing more slowly than, um, than the structure is, the growth rate slows down and eventually becomes, um, eventually stops, becomes asymptotic. And so um, this is a plot of the famous von Bertalanffy growth curve, um, which fits many, many different kinds of organisms, actually invented by someone called August Putter, and because of an accident of history, he got named after von Bertalanffy. But nonetheless, um, the depth theory explains why this curve looks like it does because of what's going on down this branch that competition between growth and maintenance. Now, similarly, um, the level of maturation that has been built up also uh, must be maintained before it can be increased. So I, I mentioned the analogy of learning a language. You have to keep practicing that language or else you'll lose it. So that's, that's the, the metaphor to think of when thinking about maturity maintenance. So energy coming down this branch has to pay for um, maintaining however much maturity has been built up so far, but any profit can go into further increasing the level of maturity. Um, so that's the notion of maintenance in depth theory, um, the maturity maintenance. And then the life cycle, how um, the depth theory goes through the transitions between the egg, uh, through the process of um, maturation to puberty and then reproduction is, first of all, with the egg, it's very simple, you just switch off feeding. And you start with a large amount of reserve and a very small amount of structure. But the equations are all identical. Um, it's just that you're starting with, with, with this big amount of reserve to structure and feeding doesn't occur. So all the dynamics uh, go on and it captures beautifully what really happens in development. So here are a, a couple of plots of, on the left-hand side, weight versus time. And I think this is in a crocodile. Um, in green, it's the it's the weight of the actual embryo itself, and uh, in in yellow, the weight of the yolk. So as the embryo is growing, of course, the structure is going up, and the total mass is going down as the organism uh, mobilizes this or uses this reserve. And respiration is happening; mass is being lost. But um, what you see with the oxygen consumption rate is, first of all, it's virtually zero at the start because the reserve doesn't require maintenance. This huge amount of mass has got an extremely low metabolic rate from the start, but the metabolic rate um, you know, increases proportionally with the, um, the size of the embryo. But remember that reserve structure interface is what the, the amount of reserve per structure is driving the flow out of the reserve. So according to the Deb theory, you expect to see um, this metabolic rate to start to, to, to slow down and curve around once you start running out of reserve in the egg, if you haven't started feeding, and that's exactly what you see. Um, so that's how depth theory explains this pattern in embryos, where in many cases, if the animal doesn't hatch before it gets to this point, you, the reserve starts running down and they start to um, show a slowdown in growth and development and so on, and respiration. Okay, so the transition, the, the, the point of birth is simply when the organism starts feeding, and that's at a certain threshold level of maturation that's been built up. So. Um, there's a certain threshold maturation level. When that hits, then the model changes to allowing the organism to feed. And so the whole feeding apparatus starts happening and the reserve is being topped up by food. And then the, the second switch <coughs> is puberty, which is where the maturation process ceases. M the maturation level, that threshold level of puberty, that uh, of maturation level is maintained. So um, you have to pay the maintenance on that level. But any profits above that go into a reproduction buffer, which is just like a buildup of another pool of reserve in the organism. And once you have enough reserve to make an egg, then that's dispensed into the environment.
So there you have it, that's the dev theory in something like 10 minutes. Um, obviously that was a pretty quick overview, but hopefully it gives you a sense of what it does. Um, and so now we can think about how this then couples with the um, biophysical model of heat and water exchange and um, as driven by the microclimatic conditions. So to give you a sense of this, I'm going to use as an example, an American lizard, the Eastern Fence Lizard, Holoporus undulatus. You can see its distribution across the US in blue here. And here's my old animation that I made a long time ago to try and explain how when you're using the integrated dynamic energy budget theory with the biophysical models, how we go through the life cycle of the organism. So you know, apologies for my poor and um, poor cartoon here, but um, hopefully it gets the message across. This is actually um, the output of a dead model plotted as um, uh, uh, where we have on the y-axis the, the depth that the animal is um, in its habitat. On the x-axis, um, this is how much shade the animal's chosen. So as the animal moves across this way, it's choosing more and more shade. And the animal is here, this little lizard sitting in its burrow, and the size of that lizard is being driven by uh, the dev model um, as we step through. So we're starting off um, at midnight on the 1st of August um, in Utah. And this lizard is asleep, of course, because it's nighttime. Um, and as we click through the hours, what's happening in the case of the actual computation is that the, the model is saying um, each, each hour it's making calculations and it's saying, is the sun up? No. Is the animal nocturnal? No. Um, can it burrow? Yes. And it puts the animal at a depth that is suitable in terms of temperature. And so at this time of year um, in August, it's um, suitable temperature just to be shallow in the ground. And so we click through the hours, it's 6 a.m. now, 7 a.m., 8 a.m. Now the sun's up, but the model is now saying, is the sun up? Yes. Is it diurnal? Yes. Puts the animal on the surface and then solves a heat budget and asks, can this animal, starting out in the open, can this animal be warm enough to forage? And if that's not the case, it stays in the burrow. So it's staying in the burrow. 9 a.m. though, after doing that calculation, body temperature is above the, vol the voluntary of the foraging limit. And so the lizard has emerged onto the surface to start feeding, but it's out in the open. Uh, it needs full sun to be warm early in the morning, 9 a.m. in August in Utah. As the day wears on, so 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 a.m., it's getting warmer and the animal's needing more and more shade. So it's moving into the burrow. Every instance here, that dynamic energy budget model is being um, computed. So um, the animal's actually growing each hour according to that model. And it's able to feed at this point because it's out on the surface. So the, the, the feed, feeding process is occurring. Um, as we go to 1 p.m., it needs more shade again. By 2 p.m., it's starting to get cooler, so the animal needs less and less shade. 5 p.m., it's in full, full sun almost. And then by 6 p.m., it's too cold, and the animal has retreated to its burrow for the day. And then uh, we go through the rest of the day. It stays in its burrow. So I'm not going to step through each hour through a whole year. Um, what I'm going to do is now jump in months on the 15th of each month at 1 p.m. So now we've jumped to the middle day of August, so the 15th of August. You can see the lizard is needing to be in the shade at this time, and it's grown a little bit. It's been a couple of weeks of growth. Uh, now in September, it's grown a little more. October, it's grown further, but you can see it's now in the middle of the day. It's actually having to stay in full sun, and its activity window is presumably declining as, as we're going into the cooler months. And then by November, it's uh, it's it's too cold even to be foraging in the middle of the day, so the animal's gone uh, into its burrow to overwinter. At this point, it can overwinter at a relatively shallow depth, but as we move through the winter in Utah, it gets really cold, uh, so it has to go deep to avoid getting um, too cold, freezing to death. So January, too cold. Um, February, it's still too cold, but they could come up near the surface at this point. Um, in March, it's still cold, but by April, it's warm enough to come out. And you can see this lizard over that period of time, you can see there's some eggs growing inside it. So it's matured and the reproduction 
this, the reproduction buffer is filling up, the maturation stopped. And so now, as we go through the spring, um, the eggs are growing um, and uh, the amount of shade is required is going up in June. Um, and then finally, um, on the 31st of July, it's built up enough um, reproduction buffer for a clutch. And you'll see it if you dump the eggs, the mass goes down because some of the reproduction buffers come out and the animals reproduced. So that's how these things integrate. Uh, the integration of the biophysical model, computing the microclimates, working out the body temperatures and the behavior and the dynamic energy budget model, getting the temperature from this and whether or not it can come out and feed and that whole thing integrating into how the animal's growing and developing and going through its reproductive cycle. So you can then use this integrated system to plot the time course of the animal's mass through time. This is the output of all of this, the body mass through time. So here we have years since, ha since hatching of a, a fence lizard, in this case in Colorado, wet mass here, you can see it hatches, grows for a little bit over winters and there's not much growth and a bit of loss of mass. And then um, spring comes and it grows a bit more, but it doesn't get to reproduce over winters. And then in the second spring, you can see these block, these um, jumps in biomass. This is when clutches are coming out. So it has two clutches at the end of its uh, second year over winters. And then in these later years, it can have uh, four clutches each time, this time five clutches. So we can predict the fecundity of the organism by doing this. Also, it turns out that um, in this lizard, the survivorship of adult females is beautifully negative, negatively related to the number of hours of potential activity. That makes sense because the mortality rate when you're out of your hole, out of your retreat site, um, is much higher than when you're hiding. So if you accumulate how many hours you've been out of your retreat, that's going to give an idea of survivorship. So from this, we can make a life table. So for each, each year of the lizard's life, we can say, what is the reproduction rate? And what is the, the mortality rate? I'm um, sorry, mortality rate, reproduction rate. Multiply those together and we can get the finite rate of, finite rate of increase or the, or the um, uh, intrinsic rate of increase, some measure of population growth. So if we run that calculation across the whole range of the lizard, then we can map out how many clutches can that animal have at a given location um, over, its, over its lifetime. And that's what's plotted here. So you saw in Colorado, um, there, there was potential to have about four clutches per year, but as you go further and further north, that window of activity um, is going down and down. So the number of clutches is going down. Of course, Conversely, as you go further and further south, it's getting warmer and so they can mature earlier and they can have more clutches. So fecundity is going up as you go south. But um, that survivorship function in terms of activity time is also um, going, well, is, survivorship is now going down as you go further south because of the activity hours going up. And combining those two things together to plot the um, uh, intrinsic rate of increase we end up with a map that looks like this, which just so happens to match the distribution of the Eastern Fence Lizard reasonably well. So here we've gone all the way through to an, an estimate of population growth rate based on the just the thermal constraints and how they are driving the energy budget uh, in this particular case. And have it's led us to a hypothesis that the distribution limits could be explained simply by um, to a large extent, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, um, in a rough sense, um, by the, the simple dynamics of um, mortality versus fecundity as driven by the, the, to the temperature of the environment. That's what this leads us to as a hypothesis to go and test. The nice thing about this kind of modeling is it really tells you what you should see if you go out into the field um, in terms of each hour, what the animal should be doing behaviorally, what its temperature should be. Um, what stage in its life cycle it should be at a given time of year. These are all things the model's saying, um, making an explicit prediction about. And so you can go and see if all of these things are true um, and, and, and ground truth them. Uh, so I'll give you a second example um, that isn't integrating the DEB theory, but is showing you how we can do this in the case of an endotherm, because I've only really spoken about ectotherm so far. So here's a, a quick example of, a, of an endotherm. <clears throat> 
I've got a picture of a, an Australian gliding possum here called the greater glider. Now, um, often people think about endotherms as not being so sensitive to temperature, but of course they are really sensitive to temperature. Um, and as I'm sure many of you are aware, a basic physiological thing is that as you change the ambient temperature, the energy requirements of an endotherm are changing. And that's because, um, I mean, the, the heat budget equation is exactly the same as, as for a lizard um, in a, or for an ectotherm in a case of an endotherm. It's just that the body temperature is not changing. And so we're solving the heat budget in terms of the metabolic rate. So in trying to solve the heat budget, you say what metabolic rate is required to balance the heat budget so that the body temperature stays constant. In the case of a greater glider, about 35.7 degrees. So as we cool the environment down, trying to stay at 35.7 degrees, the greater glider raises its metabolic rate. And that of course increases its uh, requirements for food. And there's a certain point called the lower critical temperature at which this starts to rise. Um, and there's also a certain point at the upper end where metabolic rate starts to rise, either because the core temperature is starting to go up and core temperature goes up with, uh, metabolic rate goes up with core temperature, but it could also be because the animal starts to pant or um, lick its fur or something like this, um, flap its wings to, to increase the, the airflow or something like this so that you end up with um, a higher metabolic rate from the uh, muscle activity. But we usually do get this inflection point um, at the upper end as well. And if you're measuring water loss, you'll see at this point, water loss starts going up really high. So what's happened here is the animals, as, as you warm the animal up, it reaches um, the base metabolic level, which is just the, energy, the metabolic rate required for existence. It can't go below that. So once you start to get um, too hot, they have to dump heat somehow by, um, by losing water usually. And that zone where they're happy, the sweet spot is the thermoneutral zone. And so endotherms are spending a lot of time and energy trying to stay in, their, in that zone as much as possible to minimize their energy and water costs. I just realized my pointer wasn't on, sorry about that. Um, but yes, this is the thermal neutral zone. So as I say, when we're solving the heat budget for um, a mammal, it's just the same as the heat budget I showed you for a lizard, but this term is pl being played with and this term is being played with. And there's differences in terms of the, the, the exact equations and the traits because we have the insulation in terms of fur and that sort of thing. So, but it's the same basic principles of solving these kinds of equations. So here's an example where we try to understand the distribution limits of the greater glider in this way. Um, so we can, we can take uh, existing data ob observations of the metabolic rate of the great, greater glider as a function of temperature and see whether we can capture this with the biophysical model set up for this particular kind of animal, this particular ball of fur, putting the appropriate fur properties on there and, um, and various other, other parameters about how they actually go about thermoregulating. Um, and, and so that, that's the, the dashed line is the fit of the model prediction of metabolic rate against the observed metabolic rate. And then there were three water loss rate measurements that um, had been made for this species at high temperature. And so um, the dashed line represents the model predictions of the water loss rate um, at this high temperature range. So we can test how well it works. Sorry, <laughs> the, this red line is the model prediction here. And, and the, the dashed line was just to eyeball fit through the data. But yeah, it works. It can capture the dynamics of water and uh, energy exchange going on, at least in the metabolic chamber. So then we can take that to the field and run that across the landscape, make calculations of in each location, how much energy and how much water is required to live in that location. Then we can work out, well, how much energy and water goes into making a gram of baby? So we can convert, we can work out Right, here's how much energy and water is in milk, and here's how much energy and water, uh, how much milk you need to make a baby, and the, um, you know, the various losses involved in making the milk, and so on. And you can come to a conclusion, or a, you can come to a calculation of how many grams of baby can a greater glider make on its profit of energy and water at each location in the landscape. In some places, they're going to run out of, they're, they're going to have insufficient energy and water. The costs are going to be too high because it's either too cold an environment or too warm an environment. In other places, they're going to have a, you know, a greater or lesser surplus. Uh, in some places, water will be limiting. In other places, energy will be limiting. And this is the map that we get. This is the number of grams of baby 
that we calculated for the greater glider across its range. Um, and then you can do interesting things like say, well, what if it had a different body size? What would be um, the optimal body size, given that the size of the animal is affecting these calculations? What would maximize the reproduction rate? And um, so um, we tried two different body sizes and found that the smaller body size is better in the more northern part of the range. And that's in fact what you see, that there's a, there's a smaller version of the greater glider in the northern part of its range. And then you can make plots of what's limiting. So um, in this plot here, the orange area, which is in the, more, the colder parts of Australia, are up in our little alpine area, um, where there is actually snow at the moment, and in the island of Tasmania, way down south in some of the mountainous areas, the model's predicting that they would be running out of energy and would not be able to reproduce. Um, whereas in these more inland areas, um, the, either the overall water budget or particularly the water budget in September, which is the dry season up in this part of the world, um, would be limiting their ability to reproduce. And everywhere else, it would be protein in the green because it's not water, it's not energy. So um, the intake of leaves is, uh, in, in terms of um, protein content is what's limiting. And then if you um, take a map of uh, a mask layer of forest cover, because these gliders, they can only eat eucalypt trees, so they can only live where there are trees, um, we end up with a final distribution map that looks like this, masking out the, the non-forested areas. And so you can see the black dots are the distribution, and we're predicting that they would be in Tasmania potentially, but they're not. We predict that they would be further out into the west of Victoria, but they're not. And we'd also predict them to be in Western Australia, but they are not. Um, and here is a Maxent model that we made, which is a much tighter fit to the distribution, also predicting Tasmania to be Tasmania to be suitable, but not predicting Western Australia to be suitable. So really interesting when you can make these comparisons of a statistical model and a mechanistic model of the environmental requirements. And I'll say a little bit, a little bit more about um, this comparison, and also in in general how we can integrate correlative and mechanistic models in the last part of this section on mechanistic niche modelling. 